All I can say is uh, count me out. Enough is enough. I've tried to be helpful. Vice President Pence, what they're asking you to do, you won't do because you can't. So my, Mr. Vice President, just hang in there. They, they said we can count on Mike. All of us can count on the Vice President. You're going to do the right thing. You're going to do the constitutional thing. You got a son who flies F-35s. You got a son-in-law who flies F-18s. They're out there flying so that we can get it right here. There are people dying to my good friend from Illinois to make sure we have a chance to argue among ourselves. And when it's over, it is over. It is over. So that's the Senator Lindsey Graham. Uh, on January 6th, when the pre- vice president refused to leave the Capitol and they went back, they reconvened after the uh, the breach of the perimeter. And then it was time to make the election official. And that was Lindsey Graham. You chronicled that as one of the most moving moments, probably in your career, in your life with your family there, citing your, your son and your son-in-law. And that's all in your book. Uh, so help me God. Can you bring us back to that moment? It was, uh, it's hard to hear it without emotion. Have you heard it since? Um, only once. You know, Lindsey Graham gets it. He's worn the uniform of the United States. He's been a great champion of our armed forces. But in that moment after that tragic day when we reconvened the Senate, um, he spoke those words with uh, my wife, and our daughter, Charlotte, who never left my side that day, in the gallery. Charlotte's husband, Henry, was deployed aboard the USS Nimitz. And uh, when he said those words, I glanced and saw my wife put her arm around Charlotte and hug her. But Lindsey Graham was right. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've got men and women all over the world wearing the uniform of the United States every day, keeping their oath taking risks without regard to their personal safety so we can get it right here. And um, I'll always be grateful for those words. So what happened is that that day you go into detail on it and you go that day and you say, I'm not leaving. And and you trusted your body, man. But you say he was a big guy. You trusted him, but they wanted you to get in the car. And you said, no, I'm not getting in the car because uh, I'll trust you and your word, but you're not driving. So you were concerned if you got in the car, they were going to drive you right out of that garage into somewhere else. And you thought it would be a bad symbol for the country, for the vice president to leave and to be forced out by a mob. At what point did this, uh, did you feel your security was in jeopardy? And at what point did you hear Hang Mike Pence was being chanted? Well, I have to be honest with you. Um, and I give God the glory. But in that moment, I felt no fear. I was angry. I was angry at what I saw. Uh, People that were rioting in the Capitol building, vandalizing, assaulting police officers. I was filled with indignation as I write in my book. Were we watching that on monitors or did you hear about it later? Well, first in my office just off the Senate floor where where we were holding until we – until we walked to the loading dock below the Capitol building. But I just looking at the images, I I was filled with a sense of not this, not here, not in America. And um, and I was absolutely determined to be a part of the solution, to do whatever I could, stay at my post and finish our work. And I'll always believe, um, always believe that uh, by God's grace, uh, we did our duty that day under the Constitution and the laws of the United States. And you did. And and you, you gaveled in. You gaveled in the the electoral results. Now, the president was uh, pushing. We all know this. It's been chronicled before. It was pushing the whole time. So, Mike, you don't have to do this. Uh, there's going to be another elector said there's so much corruption in this election. We can't allow this to happen. Do you believe there was corruption in the election? Were you open? If you saw it, uh, would you have acted differently if you thought this was corrupted? If you thought this was corrupt, if you if some of the video that they said was these votes that were made up came true? Uh, Brian, I, I, I said on January 6th and in the weeks before that I shared the concern of millions of Americans about voting irregularities that had taken place. I mean, the, the simple fact is that there were states that, that changed the rules in the name of Pennsylvania, COVID. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. In fact, in both cases, after the election, the courts would find that 
changes that were made in the laws were not consistent with state law. But I never saw evidence of widespread fraud. I stayed open to it, um, but the evidence would simply never come. But that didn't mean that debating those irregularities sure. lacked value. It's one of the things that I said in my open letter to Congress and the American people on January 6th. I made it clear that I intended to keep my oath, pledge that I'd made to the American people and that ended with a prayer, so help me God. But I also told the Congress and the American people that there was there was nothing wrong with members of Congress bringing objections and having a debate over voting irregularities and, and any evidence that they might be able to bring forward. I mean, disputes over electoral votes under American law are resolved by the elected representatives of the American people, not by one person. Um, and I had said in the days before that I welcome the debate. I mean, one of the one of the uh, sad aspects of that day, beyond the loss of life, beyond the vandalism and the rioting, was that ultimately what um, what transpired at the Capitol ended up obscuring uh, what what may well have been a very useful debate over voting irregularities that took place. The Wisconsin Supreme Court actually found that uh, that Wisconsin had violated their own state laws not once but twice. The Supreme Court sequestered some eight thousand uh, ballots in the state of Pennsylvania that had been that had arrived after the deadline for election. Those didn't change the outcome of the election, but for all of us who are concerned about election integrity, um, that debate was potentially very important and it could have facilitated what fortunately has been happening in Republican states around the country, and that is election reforms over the last two years. Georgia straightened it out. Seems to have. Georgia right? did. Florida straightened right. it out. They Texas. embarrassed the country for two right. or three cycles, uh, Texas. But you know who didn't? Arizona. I mean, you got to be kidding me. I mean, what are they doing? I mean, it's a week later. We're still counting votes. Why is this? Why is this happening? I can't. I can't figure it. Um, of course, I'm. Um, California's still look, counting. Look, mail-in mail voting has a long tradition in this country. Absentee balloting voting in Indiana. But we know how to count the votes. Maybe into the wee hours in the morning. But we, <laughs> virtually every state in the yeah. union, absent those two right now, has found a way to count the votes within the day or day after election day and that uh, that ought to be the aspiration of uh of every state in the union so uh so that happens after that and um and we know the president of the united states has got himself in trouble for how he acted then because georgia is suing him right now when he took it, the records back to mar-a-lago that at the very least i don't care how it turns out that's that's been a problem since had the president said, we lost, I can't figure it out, Mike, uh, let's go call the Bidens and let's bring them through, we'll tour through the House and you get, uh, we'll tour them through the House. You, you take uh, 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 Vice President-elect Harris through the observatory I am at, and just called it a day and flew out, actually went to the inauguration and flew out. I think his approval rating would be about 60 percent right now. And I think he'd be talking about, hey, Mike, what do you say we go do this again? And you probably wouldn't even be thinking about running for president. Did my, am my assumptions wrong? You know, I think during the disastrous years of the Biden-Harris administration. And it really has been. People have come to even more appreciate uh, what President Trump and I accomplished during those years with Republican majorities in the House and Senate in the first two years. I mean, think about it. The largest increased investment in our national defense, the creation of the first branch of our new branch of our armed forces in 70 years. We crushed, our, our armed forces crushed the ISIS caliphate, took down their leader, took out Qasem Soleimani, held the Syrian uh, dictator Assad responsible for using chemical weapons not once but twice. Russia made no effort to try and redraw international lines under our administration. Uh, North Korea stopped testing nuclear weapons, stopped firing missiles. Abraham, we, of course. We, had, we made incredible progress in the Middle East. Bring it home. We cut taxes, roll back regulation. We became a net exporter of energy for the first time in 70 years. Three Supreme Court justices, a new beginning for the right to life in America following our administration and our appointments. And I think the American people look at this administration that has had literally weakened America at home and abroad every single day. And they long to go back to those policies. But I, I will I will tell you, uh, hindsight uh, is 2020. I, I write candidly in 
in So Help Me God about my pride in all that we accomplished and how we accomplished it in our administration, my battles uh, as a conservative in the House and my service as governor of Indiana, and lessons learned along the way. But I do believe in the days ahead, the American people long to get back to what we did, to what we know works. But, Mr. but I, think, I think they're looking for leadership. Uh, I think they're looking for, for leadership that could unite our country around our highest ideals. Do you think the president could have done a better job uniting, especially as you wrote the book and reflected? Well, I, one of the things I write in the book is what, what many of the president's critics fail to acknowledge is in my lifetime, I never saw the level of opposition by the Democrats and most of the national media that we saw uh, to our president and in, in to our administration from day one. I recount in So Help Me God uh, being with the president in the Oval Office, his first visit there on our inauguration day in 2017. And we walked back uh, to the White House, just the two of us, um, to meet up with our families and go to the inaugural balls. And I remember he looked up at the brightly lit side of the White House and he said, Mike, this is, this is, and he paused and I said, it's humbling. And he turned and looked at me and said, that's it. It is. It's humbling. And I said, I said, yeah. it is, Mr. President. But I say in the book, at that moment, as we walk back to the White House on the evening of January 20th, 2017, on a stack of newspapers right outside the Oval Office was the Washington Post, the headline of which was, the quest to impeach Donald Trump starts today. And it never let up. Two and a half years of the Russian hoax impeaching the president for a phone call. I mean, the constant berating, the constant uh, You had no, not one day of high five, we made it, bouncing on the couches, let's, let's give these guys a shot. Almost not one. In fact, we all know the stories now. The books have been written, a million of them, of uh, the whole Russia thing. They came out of thin air. You had the FBI against you and the whole establishment against you. It's incredible. And now they say, why, how dare you challenge elections? You guys were challenged every day. Every day. Every no, the president's illegitimate <clears throat> president. So Look, I, I, you know, uh, as I said, I've always believed that we did our duty under the Constitution that day for the peaceful transfer of power. Um, and you've heard much in the national media talking about election deniers yeah. and they're entitled to But what about Hillary Clinton, who said our election was stolen? Absolutely. Uh, what about uh, all the Democrats, including Hillary Clinton, that spent years saying that Donald Trump was not the legitimate president of the United States, undermining public confidence in our elections? What about Joe Biden uh, calling Georgia's sensible, responsible election reforms Jim Crow 2.0? I mean, look, I, I hold the view that it's... Uh, uh, it, it is it is time to to put aside this kind of reckless rhetoric across the spectrum, and but in so help me God, I I really try and chronicle what right. we accomplished under unprecedented and, opposition. And you did you talked day. about some decisions in uh, session should have been asked to step aside as soon as he had any interaction with Russia it would have been a lot easier. There would have been no Mueller report. And you would have got over in a day because there was no there there. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.